audience, welcome to another um, talk uh, on our ongoing series of our winter warmer talks aimed at bringing you a little light and community during uh, these months and uh, to highlight and showcase the various features of our wonderful Royal Parks. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm one of the learning officers here at the Royal Parks. Uh, don't be alarmed if you notice that my name does not correlate to what you can see on the screen. I am very much not Laura, who is our community engagement officer and usually presents these talks uh, due to the technical setup that we have in place at the moment. Uh, we're just having to set it up via that way. So don't be alarmed uh, if you're expecting Laura, she'll be helping present on some of our other future talks going forward in the next few weeks. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, we're a charity that looks after the eight Royal Parks in London. So for those of you that don't know the Royal Parks, they are Hyde Park, uh, Kensington Gardens, uh, the Green Park, St James's Park, Regent's Park and Primrose Hill, Bushy Park, Greenwich Park and Richmond Park. And in addition to those Royal Parks, we also look after Brompton Cemetery and Victoria Tower Gardens. And so through our work, we aim to engage as many people as possible with the rich heritage that the parks have to offer. So keeping them free and accessible so that everyone can enjoy um, the well-being benefits if they want, and also to protect and improve the parks, the wonderful biodiversity that is wildlife we have in the parks. Um, so these, where am I? Here we are. So these talks are free, but if you, oh, no, there we are. Fantastic. So. Just again, as a reminder that these are all uh, being filmed and everything, so please uh, be aware of that. And um, as we go through the talk, please feel free to use the uh, chat to say hello. Um, let us know where you're listening from. So I'll just uh, in the chat, just do a little wave so everyone can see what I am doing there. There's a little raise hand there so people can get an idea of what's happening in this chat do a little applause there we are thank you sally saying hello from richmond fantastic so we can use the chat function we'll be using that later on as well for any questions and things that we have that we will answer at the end of the talk as well uh, as well um, and you're also to are welcome to react to any uh, parts of the talk as well so please do feel free to use the chat and we will be utilizing that later on as well um so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's guest speaker because we are all here for our Winter Tree ID walk. Um, so I'd like to welcome Greg Packman, who uh, previously worked as the tree officer for the Royal Parks and uh, now currently works for Islington Council. Uh, so just to give a little bit of background, so he's very passionate about all things tree related. And um, Greg uh, quite frequently uh, donates his time to help lead most of our tree walks in the parks. So tonight he's going to talk to you about how you can identify some of the wonderful trees we have in the park uh, during these winter months uh, where ID can be a little bit harder. Um, I'm like yourself, like myself, uh, I struggle as well just as much. So I'm very much looking forward to finding out a bit more information as are you and uh, hopefully learn a few more tips and tricks on how we can identify that. Oh, great to see everyone messaging in, people from Essex, West Midlands, Putney Heath, Kentish Town, Mitcham. Great to see such a range of people from all over the place. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it over to Greg. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Alex. <clears throat> yes, I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, yeah, so before I sort of go any further on to uh, the presentation, just a bit myself briefly. Um, yeah, so I, I worked for the Royal Parks and the tree management team for four quite fantastic years. Uh, cover, I was predominantly in Hyde Park, St James's Park, Kensington Gardens, Green Park. Um, really, really wonderful job. Um, uh, I sort of moved on for uh, career progression, basically. There was no, yeah big part of me misses the park in a huge way and a big part of what I did was working with community groups doing community education um, and engagement so I sort of carried on as a volunteer to carry on with, with these walks. Um, yes yeah, so, so I've worked for Islington Council but because of the way that my job set up I, I'm involved in a few different tree management places across London so I'm currently involved in the project at Epping Forest, Alexandra Palace, uh, West Ham Park, City of London, 
London Wildlife Trust amongst other places. So um, yeah, I spend most of my days out working trees, looking at trees. Um, most of my life revolves around trees, to be honest. Uh, anyway, so talking about winter tree identification, one of the reasons why I do this particular presentation is winter tree identification especially is uh, a real challenge. Uh, it can be very tricky to get your head around, get your eye into as such. Um, and I kind of deliver this pretty much in the way that I first sort of taught myself. So I try and, for me, rather than taking like an academic or a bit, uh, botanical approach, so I'm tripping over my words there, I try and do it as practically and comprehensively as possible. And the way that we'll be looking at this is I'll be showing you what to look for across the winter um, and essentially how to identify trees with no leaves on. But rather than, so I'll, be, I'll be showing you the themes and principles of identification. Uh, I'm not the best at spelling, so I'm hoping I've put the correct use of the term principle there. Um, so rather than doing like a tree by tree guide of this is an oak, this is how you identify an oak, this is a beach, this is how you identi identify a beach, I'll try and show you the themes and principles that you can sort of basically teach you a framework that you can then go out with your apps or your tree books or your botanical key or whatever to help you then identify the trees themselves. So we'll be covering various features like the buds, the bark, the seeds. This might seem a bit odd, but the texture, the patterns and the shapes of the trees, this is something that's really useful and important and helpful in identifying trees in winter, as well as a few other uh, anatomical features as well. But also I have five golden rules of upgrade it slightly. I'm a very rules based person. Rules help regulate the fun and you know used correctly can help learn as well. So for an online talk this isn't quite as applicable but when we do the real life version I really insist on this is touch and feel every single tree because we have five senses, but most of us barely even use our eyesight to, to notice trees. A few people just glance at a tree, don't even really see it. So by all means, of course, use your sight. That's our first primary sense for looking at trees. But, you know, look in detail. And as I'll go along, as the talk goes along, I'll explain how using the sensation of touch really helps me in identifying trees, um, be it a rough or a smooth twig or shoot or the feel of a leaf. There can sometimes be really subtle differences and sort of touching the tree can really help you uh, learn. Plus also I feel like touching it and listening to the tree, listening to the sound in the wind, it gives a much deeper experience. You form more of a connection with each tree. Second rule, really work at your own pace in your own way. Everybody learns in different ways. I'm much more of a tactile and visual learner. I can read anything in a book but it won't make sense if I see it in real life. Whereas my manager I used to work for, he, he can pretty much read a catalogue of trees and memorise everything. So we work in different ways. And also really don't compare yourself against anybody else. Back in 2009, when I started my journey with trees, I genuinely did not know that acorns came from oak trees. That's how little I knew at that time. And you can build up the knowledge quite quickly. Just find your own way and take it at your own pace because we all have different backgrounds and experiences. We all have different primary interests and it kind of leads us to learn in different ways. So just because someone might seem to grasp one particular thing quicker than you doesn't mean that they'll grasp everything in that way. Um, and really the identification is just practice, perseverance and patience. Don't be put off by the challenges. I liken it to fitness. It takes a long time to build up a high level of fitness and it takes a lot of practice to maintain that. But Keeping with the fitness analogy, you don't have to be an Olympic level athlete to go do like a park run on a weekend. You can do a 5K with not a great deal of training. And the same thing with your identification, you can build up to a decent level without having to know all the advanced level trees. And, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of trees. I wouldn't have a clue what they are. Lots of tropical and exotic ones. Um, and also with each tree, try and learn five characteristics. Try and memorize about five things about each tree. The three key ones will be uh, the buds of the tree, the bark and the seeds in winter. But for the other two, maybe it could be the touch and the feel, the texture of the tree. It could be particular bark patterns or it might even be something like 
the cultural histories of each tree, something that helps you uh, learn, find out more. It could be a particular story, it could be a particular folklore, something that really triggers that memory, uh, memory break when you see a tree. And also, there's no such thing as bad questions or stupid questions, it's just my ability to answer those questions. Because if you think you have a question, but you're too embarrassed to ask, ask it because you think it's a bit stupid, guaranteed there's going to be five or six other people who are thinking the same thing but might not be able to answer it, ask it. And then, yeah, what could be a, you might think is a bad question could also help somebody else. So don't feel like there's any completely ridiculous questions, so feel free to ask. Um, and also in terms of what resources are out there for identification, uh, traditionally you'd probably use a botanical key or a dichotomous key where you look at uh, features of the tree or the plant and then you run it through like a, a deductive table. Those are quite challenging and I struggle with them, but the Natural History Museum do a really, really, really brilliant tree identification key. You can just Google Natural History Museum True Identification Key and it should come up with a link to the PDF. If you want to go that way, this is the one that I really recommend because I think it's a brilliant resource. Um, a lot of people still use tree guides, tree books, and this, uh, the Collins Black Book by Owen Johnson. Uh, David, it, that's one, probably the best and most comprehensive. Um, but then not everybody works so well with that. In the modern world, we have a number of apps, sort of iNaturalist is one of the main ones. This is called LeafSnap. I forgot to actually put the name, but just the logo. So this is LeafSnap and Tree Guide. When it comes to trees, especially the apps I found can be really, really good. For wildflowers, they can, well, other plants, they can be a bit hit and miss. But for trees, these apps, I do put a lot of faith in these. I think they are really good. And, you know, going for an app, as opposed to a book or a key, it, it's not cheating, it's not taking the easy way out, it's what helps you. Like when it comes to maths, I'm hopeless at adding and subtracting, so I use a calculator. That's what helps me with that thing. So, you know, just because it's more, more some people do dismiss apps because they're modern and on phones. I think if it helps you, it's absolutely valid. So, moving on to the actual tree bit now. So I'll, before we look at any actual trees, I'll start with the actual twig anatomy of things to look for, because when it comes to the first thing to look for with winter tree identification are the buds. So this is the overwinter storage of next year's leaves. And each tree species, the buds are almost as different as fingerprints to a human being. While not every single individual tree will have different buds, each species will have different and distinct buds. And there's always, always, always exceptions to the rules, but by and large, they're broken down into two main categories where you have opposite buds, where the buds emerge at opposite points on the stem, or alternate buds, where you have single buds coming out at different parts of the stem. And looking back to how I taught myself, I very much use the process of deduction, so trying to work out what the tree is by ruling out what it isn't. So say you're, you're in a park, you're in a woodland, you find a tree, you look at the buds and you see its opposites, you can straight away rule out every alternate budded tree species going. Now, that might sound incredibly basic and obvious, but in the instance of opposite budded trees, there are far, far, far fewer groups of trees that have opposite buds than alternates. So you can straight away make that so much easier. And by and large in the UK, it's going to be the ash trees, the maples and the horse chestnuts. There's also things like uh, elder, uh, tree of heaven and walnuts that have opposite buds or slightly off centred opposites. But those are the main three you're going to find. So that's something that can help you uh, quite easily uh, or help you start that identification process. And actually looking at the twig anatomy itself, uh, the position of the buds. So we have things called the apical and the axillary buds, also known or easier to remember as terminal and lateral. So the terminal bud is this one here, the apical bud. So that's where the um, next year's growth will start. So that's where the tree is growing out, expanding its canopy, reaching new areas of sunlight. And then after that one started to grow, these, I won't go into tree biology, but in this part of the bud, there's a number of hormones produced, including one called auxin, which suppresses these lateral buds. 
while this goes out searching for the sunlight and growth, these sort of produce um, mopping up sunlight leaves. So these are called the, the lateral buds. And actually looking at the position of the buds, keeping a note of the terminal and then the lateral buds or apical and axillary. Um, I, I prefer to use terminal and lateral just because it's easier to remember. And the term axillary is a little too similar to auxiliary, which are different things. And also the point at which the bud emerges from the twig. So this area here is called the node, N-O-D-E, and that's where the bud emerges from the twig. And then the gap between each node is called the internode. And while each individual tree may put on a different amount of growth each year, by and large, the genetics of each tree have a fairly distinct internodal gap to the gap between each node. And something like this twig here, you have quite a large gap between each bud. And some of the trees that we'll look at later, like oak and ash, the gap between each bud is really, really small. So this, the node and the internode, it's not quite as important as the uh, uh, the buds opposite on alternates and stuff like that, but it can be a very helpful uh, feature, especially when trying to distinguish between some quite similar trees. Um, say you found a native ash and a single leaf ash, which is a far less common ornamental tree. The internodal gap between the single leaf ash is millimetres, whereas the ash itself is about a centimetre or so. But looking at the gaps between each buds can also uh, be a helpful characteristic as well. We need to go into that little bit extra detail. So on to the first tree itself. Uh, I always, where I can, start with horse chestnuts because they, in my opinion, are an absolutely brilliant learning resource because every identification feature that you need on a horse chestnut, it's kind of there, but much, much bigger, much bolder, much more conspicuous, much easier to see. And if you have even a basic interest in trees, if you're not familiar with the horse chestnut tree itself, guaranteed you're probably uh, familiar with Compton's at the very least as well. And because horse chestnuts, it's still a very common tree. So you go to a park or a formal garden, you're very likely to see one of these trees. And before I go into any minute details of the tree, um, if there's any bird watchers out there, you'll be familiar with the term, uh, the jizz of the bird, the general impression, something, something. It's basically in bird in birding, you're able to work out, identify the bird by how it flies, by its, its sort of shape and structure. And you can do the same with, with trees. So if you look at the canopy of this tree, not every horse chestnut will have a lean, but it does have, as a rule, they do have very pendulous branches, quite a big and broad tree with sort of looping over branches like that, very pendulous. And as we'll see on the next slide, the buds are in opposites and they're very large, and sort of purpley brown. So here's the, uh, the buds of the horse chestnut. So this is the terminal bud here. And I like these because they're very, very large, very easy to see. And in this case here, you can see that they're opposites. So again, you see this tree, you don't know what it is. You can rule out all the um, alternate budded trees. You look through your, your tree guide, your app, uh, your key. And then in that case, you'll the first thing you'll get probably get asked is what are the buds like? In this case, they're big, bullet shaped, brown, browny purple, and they have overlapping scales. But this is where I talk about the texture and the feel. As you can see, this is quite quite gloopy. And one of the characteristics of a horse chestnut is big sticky buds. It's actually a protective measure because there's a lot of energy and nutrients stored over winter in, in the buds. So lots of insects want to get in, sort of steal all the sugars. And of course, the tree wants to protect itself against predation. So it, it creates this sort of sticky resin that coats the buds. And sometimes you can actually see dead insects, dead small insects on, this, on the buds of horse chestnuts. Um, also, a couple of other features. One thing that's quite handy is this sort of triangular half diamond shape. This is the bud scar, or no, sorry, the leaf scar. So last year's leaves, this is the point at which where the stalk of the leaf was attached to the twig. And 
when the leaf starts to in, in autumn there's anatomical changes so this section here it, it forms what's called an abscission layer so this will sort of be converted into corky tissue which allows the leaf to blow off in the wind without causing any damage to the twig and at least behind this distinct scar in these little circles those are vascular pathways where sap and water moves from the twig into the leaf and then the sugars from uh, photosynthesis um, are moved back from the leaf into the twig and again it's much more bold and conspicuous than the horse chestnut but if you want to memorize it you can learn about the leaf scars and how they're different on each tree um, also so again there's, you can only see one set of buds here so there's quite a big internodal gap very distinct brown purple overlapping scaled sticky buds uh, opposites and moving on to the next one looking at the bark as well so in the winter you're far more likely well you're obviously going to be seeing the bark a lot more because that's all there really is and each type of tree has different bark patterns and then with the horse chestnut it's kind of like a browny gray and you have these sort of small plated scaled bark and as we move from tree to tree across uh, the presentation, you'll see different types of bark and how they look against each other. So sort of memorizing the pattern of each bark and also uh, touch and feel the bark as well. Touch everything that you can. If we go back this side, you, you, you sort of rub your thumb, your fingers across this. It's quite rough. It's, it's a very thick stem and quite rough, which will become more important on the next tree, which I'll explain. Uh, and then of course, the seeds. Um, each tree species has very, very distinct different seeds, and these aren't permanently attached well, for very important reasons. They're not attached to the tree all year round because they need to hit the soil, they need to move away to grow into new trees. But they produce very, very different uh, trees, produce very different seeds. If you compare this to the, the seeds of an apple, you see there's an apple compared to a conker, uh, acorns ash, keys, helicopters. So getting to grips with the seeds of different trees is a great way. And these aren't wind, uh, wind-borne seeds. They, they drop from the tree with the hope that um, an animal will come up and move it along. Very classic characteristic. You have the spiky case and then the one uh, chestnut coloured chestnut seed inside. And of course, this is not cheating. If it helps you, it's not cheating. You can look at the base of each tree and you can see the seeds underneath it. That's a great way of helping you, as long as there's not lots of different trees in the same area, with all the same seeds under one tree. Um, chestnuts are very heavy, so they're not going to be gravity in the wind. But uh, you know, don't think it's cheating to rely on what's underneath the tree to help you identify it. Uh, moving on to the second tree, is the lime tree and I kind of deliberately went for a tree silhouette um, so you can sort of rely on different features of the tree. So this is uh, another very familiar tree you'll see it in parks, formal gardens, street trees, uh, woodlands if you like you find it in an ancient woodland and this is very different from the horse chestnut because it has alternate buds and slightly less obvious in how it, its identification features. So this is the bud from the lime, which you'll recognize from an earlier slide. So straight away, we can see we have alternate buds. So you can rule out all the opposite budded trees, which isn't quite as easy because there are far more that are alternates. That's when you start to look at the actual bud itself. So in this case, rather than a big browny purple sticky bud with overlapping scales, you have a much smaller pinky fleshy bud Sometimes on lime, they can sort of range from pinky pink to red to green, which can be a bit more challenging. But rather than overlapping scales, it's more or less one consistent bud. So again, these are sort of things that help you identify it by not just the arrangement of the buds, but how they look, how they feel. And if you look at the actual twig itself, so again, we have quite a large internodal gap. Um, different trees of the same species that are growing at different rates will have varying internodal gaps, but by and large, the, the general distance is fairly true across each uh, specimen of each tree. And whereas before the um, horse chestnut twigs, shoots, stems, 
are much thicker and quite rough. The twigs and the lime are very, very, very thin. They're very, very, very flexible. They're very glossy and waxy. So this for me is where the feel and the texture of the tree is really, really important. Actually get up there, touch it, feel it, bend and twist the twigs because these are very flexible. And you can actually feel how sort of glossy and waxy um, these uh, twigs and shoots are. If you were to go for something like a more old fashioned botanical key, it, when, you, when you get to more advanced levels, it will to ask you things like, what is the texture? Is it glossy? Is it waxy? Is it leathery? Is it rough? So again, just by feeling the textures of the tree, that's, that can sort of help you um, identify different trees. And again, here's a, here's a comparison of the two. So again, you can see opposites to alternates, uh, thick, rough twig compared to um, thin and smooth as well as the colour of the buds and the twigs as well. Uh, so looking at the bark, so colour-wise, the colours are very, very similar, both like a browny grey, but rather than like the plated overlapping scales that we call this chestnut, you have more sort of vertical and slightly curved striations, longer strips, chunks of bark compared to the small plates. And again, that's just if you want to get into that sort of thing, taking bark wrapping is, is quite cool. I think we did that when I was um, in year two or three at school. Quite fun. Uh, a bit like grass rubbing you might do in the church, but bark rubbing for me is much more uh, on point, on brand. Um, and then there are certain species characteristics. So again, this isn't a cheat way. This is something that's a genuine way of helping you. Um, it's called epicormic growth. Now, epicormic growth is something that can happen on all trees of all species. Typically, it's either a stress response to poor health or wounding. Or when the trees in the ancient phase, it might start to grow a secondary lower canopy for epicormic. But because lime trees, they're very vigorous trees, they produce a lot of this new growth at the base. Um, some trees like lime, poplar, tree of heaven, elm and blackthorn and robinia, they have incredibly specific and restrictive conditions in which their seeds can germinate. So by and large, they don't grow from seed that well. So what they can do, it's known as vegetative propagation, or vegetative reproduction, which is where they can send out either suckers from the root plate or epicormic from the growth of the trunk, where should I know, the main tree die or blow over in the wind, it can start regrowing from one of these or all of these shoots, um, something like elm, uh, largely wiped out across the UK, but it's become quite a successful hedgerow species um, up until they get big enough for Dutch elm. They sort of regrow from uh, root plate suckers because they don't quite get old enough now, so you can set seed and then they don't grow that well from seed anyway. So anyway, this kind of growth at the base, this sort of density is quite specific to lime. So usually at this point on the high park tour, when we have the, uh, we basically get the group to look, up, look across the park landscape and all of a sudden you can see all the different trees that have this epicormic growth at the base. Straight away you can draw, narrow that down to a line. And if you have a very, very obvious identification feature, at that point, go in closer and try and find all other identification features that can help you get that down to line typically the buds and the bark and the seeds and the shape and the structure as well or an obvious feature like this epicormic. Um, one quite cool thing with the lime is you so this is the outer bark it's very stringy and fibrous and it can peel off very easily from the tree so at the base of lime trees you can sort of see this sort of fibrous bark at the base referred to as the lime dust and in like ye olden days before we had manufactured textiles and uh, commercial industrialised metal working. This was quite a, an important source of materials. So it would get sort of uh, wound into rope and twine. And it's a very early sort of primitive uh, building um, resource as well. This was a very, very valuable uh, part of the pre-industrial economy. Which is, I, I find that stuff really fascinating. So the next tree, is a sweet sweet chestnut rather than the horse chestnut. 
So this is still quite a common tree, but you're perhaps going to be a bit less familiar with it, especially in winter, because it can be quite a challenging one. Um, I even know people in the tree industry who st struggle to identify young sweet chestnuts in the winter. And one of the challenging things about it is that it can look like a very, very different tree across its life stages. And I'll show you a few images very soon. Um, again, when we're on the Hyde Park walk, very conveniently we have three, or we have a group of sweet chestnuts at different ages. So I sort of break the group into three, get one part to identify a young sweet chestnut, another group to do a middle-aged sweet chestnut, and another one to do an old sweet chestnut. They inevitably identify them as three different trees. And that to me is a great example of why getting to grips with things like the buds and other anatomical features are really key because although the tree will change its appearance across its age, there are a few features that always stay the same, such as the buds and the seeds, but the bark can change across its lifespan, as we'll show you. So this is the uh, the bud of the sweet chestnut. So again, it's an alternate budded tree, uh, sort of pinky brown, uh, reddy buds, and which look very very similar to the lime. Now at this point, you can look in more detail at the bud, and you can see rather than being a solid mass, these have got sort of different scales, but also. Whereas the gap, the internal gap on the lime was much larger, here you have a much, much smaller uh, gap between each bud. So this is what, two, three centimetres, maybe an inch, an inch and a half, whereas on the lime you have maybe three to five inch gap. And also, whereas the lime was sort of thin, like a thin, smooth tube, this is a bit more ribbed and ridged and a bit rougher as well, and a different colour. So again, this is why I really sort of stress and emphasise getting to grips with the actual touch and the feel of each twig and each bud. And these are one of my favourite anatomical features on a tree. They're called length cells. It's these sort of white speckles on a twig. Now, every single tree species produces these, but some are, are more conspicuous than others. And I always point this out on a sweet chestnut because you have a brown twig with white length cells, so it's much more obvious to see. Um, other species, it can be much more difficult. Uh, these are areas of sort of corky tissue which allow gas exchange from the atmosphere into the twig. Now, bark is a protective casing that keeps the outside outside and then the inside of the tree inside. It, it protects it from damage and harm and exposure to the elements. But there are times when there needs to be sort of gas exchange between the two, particularly before uh, the leaf, uh, leaf emergence when the tree needs oxygen to kickstart respiration to grow, and it hasn't got any leaves to photosynthesize, so it can't create its own oxygen. Um, so that's one of the things that lenticels do. And sometimes lenticels can be quite raised, so you, you can physically feel them, so the twigs and the branches will feel quite rough. Um, if you've ever seen something like a cherry, particularly a Tibetan cherry, and you've ever wondered what those vertical lines on the cherry are, they're basically older, stretched out length cells. So there are some species where they are dead obvious and easy to see, like sweet chestnut, rowan, uh, horse chestnut as well, oak and cherries. And there's others like on the line where they're a bit more difficult to see. Now, uh, I love sweet chestnuts, one of my favourite trees. And when the tree gets very, very old, you have this sort of decayed mass in the middle, followed by younger branches. Here's kind of an early ancient tree, again, this wonderful sort of gnarly twisted branch. But you compare that to a young sweet chestnut, that from a distance is just a tree. It could be one of a thousand different species. How would you work out that's a sweet chestnut? Well, that's where you go and you look at the buds and then you look at the bark and various other features. And as the tree gets older, uh, if anyone knows the real reason, please feel free to put in the chat. It's not one that I've ever actually uh, read enough into to find out. But for some reason, as the tree ages, uh, the bark corkscrews goes this amazing twisted pattern. And of all the sort of shades of brown that you get in tree bark, this kind of rusty brown 
Empire. It's one of my favourites. It's absolutely stunning. And in between the young smooth bark and the old twisted bark, it's quite similar to lime in that you have these sort of vertical patterns, but it's a little bit more crisscrossed as well. And you know, here's a comparison of the crisscrossed bark of the lime compared to uh, the sweet chestnut, sorry, against the vertical striations of the lime. And then also that's a bit more of a, oh, a, like a proper brown with, I suppose this is more uh, algae or lichen, whereas this is much more of like a grey brown as well. And then of course, uh, the chestnut seeds, very, very similar to conkers, but if you were to open up the seed, then you have multiple seeds in each casing and then the, uh, the actual spikes of the sweet chestnut. They're smaller and more numerous than the horse chestnut. Um, one thing as well, to go back. So in this example, you'll see there's some old leaves. That, what I mentioned with the leaf scar earlier on, is when it comes when the tree comes in, into autumn, it forms that abscission layer, which is what allows the uh, nutrients to pass back into the tree. And then when that's done, it allows the leaf to blow off in the wind without causing any damage to the twig. Now, on predominantly beech family trees, so sweet chestnut, beech, and oak, they retain younger leaves across the canopy over winter. It's something that's referred to as leaf marquescence. Um, and the general belief of that is that they act as insulation units to protect uh, buds on younger tissues. Um, there are other trees, such as the hornbeam, that does retain the leaves. If you see uh, a tree with lots of retained dead leaves on, on the, uh, around the canopy, that can be uh, another helpful way to help you sort of um, now, at least, if not narrow it down to an exact species, and maybe narrow it down to uh, a group of trees. So in this case, uh, the beech family, oak, sweet chestnut, and beech. Um, and then for the gardeners amongst you, you probably know of this practice being used in beech and hornbeam hedging. Um, and if you have good summer tree identification, but not so confident winter tree identification, then this, if it helps you, it's not cheating. You can work out that that's a sweet chestnut leaf so straight away. You can go, oh yeah, sweet chestnut. But if you do do that, don't just take the shortcut. Look at the winter features as well. And then going back, so slightly blurry image as I had to stretch it out. So again, uh, a sycamore. So this should be a very familiar tree to a lot of people. Uh, liked by many, disliked by probably a few more. Uh, I'm, I'm in the like category. I sort of grew to like it in the end. Well, it's quite a nice, reliable parkland tree. Uh, nice sort of structure. And it's just a little too successful at establishing itself from seed quite often in places where you don't really want it to. And this to me is quite a nice example because the sycamore, the structure of it, it's very, very tree-like. From a distance, it just looks like a tree. So identifying it from a distance can be a bit more of a challenge. Identifying it from the winter, just on the shape, can be a bit of a challenge. But there's some interesting things and features. So again, this is going back to the opposite uh, bud of trees. So these are incredibly distinctive. So again, they're opposite budded, so you can rule out all alternates. And if you compare this to the um, horse chestnut, rather than big and purple, these are smaller, egg-shaped and green, with very, very distinct overlapping scales. Here you can see these length cells and you can sort of see the uh, leaf scar as well. So this is, well, for, for me, it's incredibly distinctive. That kind of lime green, you don't really confuse it with much else. But um, I mentioned at the start, when you have opposite by the trees, it's by and large, it's predominantly going to be one of three groups you're most likely to find. Uh, the maples, of which the sycamores are maple, uh, the horse chestnuts and the ash trees. Um, of course, you do have like the walnuts and shavings, as I mentioned. So in this case, you see the buds like this, 
because of the shape and the pattern, you can rule out horse chestnut group or the ashes. And depending on what type of maple it is, these will be different shapes and colours. If this was the field maple, then the buds would be smaller, as well as like a more crimson purple colour. If it's a Norway maple, it'd be the same colour, same shape, but they'd be more purple than green. And then, well, there's a lot of maples out there, uh, hundreds probably. And they all follow this sort of rough pattern, but they can be different shapes and colours. But as a starting point, getting it down to a maple will help you a lot. And this is something that I find endlessly, I, I never stop finding this absolutely mind blowing. So you can look at some twigs, and you'll see that the buds emerge at right angles to the ones above and below. And basically that um, enables greater sun exposure. And it's something that is called decussate in botanical terms. And it's based on this incredible, amazing evolutionary strategy to maximize sun exposure along the same branch. Because if you have all the branches along the same angle, then each one beneath it is successfully getting shaded out. Whereas here, you're effectively in increasing each branch of sun exposure by 100% or something. Um, and the opposite of that is distichus, which is where you have all the um, all along the same angle. Now, finding it as decussate won't help you a great deal, but on the off chance that you find a tree that is distichus, like this one here, where all the buds are facing the same way, there are, again, there are far, far, far fewer trees in this pattern than there are decussate. In this case, it's a katsura tree, which is a really nice ornamental tree. So again, this is a bit more obscure but again, it can help your identification and it's kind of, it's just one that I always want to include just because of, like I said, it always blows my mind and I never stop finding that element really fascinating. So again, compare the sycamore to the horse chestnut. You can sort of see while they're both opposites, each horse chestnut bud had its own little stalk, whereas these are tight against the stem, uh, a brown shoot as opposed to a, well, purpley brown. And again, the buds are very different as well. Uh, and if you want to, you can also start looking at things like the individual leaf scars as well. And again, looking at the bark. So as the tree ages, the bark changes. So when it's younger, it's like a, a grey brown. And as the tree gets older, uh, it starts to go. It, well, sometimes, depending on the genetics of the tree, it can either be a bigger grey smooth trunk or you can get these sort of uh, plated flakes. Again, quite often confused with a plane tree, as I'll talk about very soon. Uh, and then, of course, the seeds. <clears throat> these are sort of probably one that, outside of acorns and conkers, perhaps one of the best known, well, excluding edible fruits as well, one of the best known tree seeds. These uh, helicopters or keys, but properly known as Samaris, and they sort of start off early in the year as red and brown before fading to the green. And kind of the angle of how these are attached is quite key as well. Uh, I haven't got an image of a Norway maple, but the seeds of a Norway maple, rather than hanging at 45 degree angle or so, they're actually at a 180 degree angle. So you know, to go through all of the maple seeds is a whole presentation in itself, uh, which I'll leave to the members of the Maple Society. It's very, very complex beyond, beyond what I know, really. But actually working out and looking at the angle of the seeds. So again, I'm by no means expecting everyone to memorise it, because I, I definitely don't. But say you're at a tree, you have something like the Collins Tree Guide, and you, you, you can see the seeds on the tree. You can sort of run through uh, the book through the maple section, looking at what the seeds look like as well. And if it's at 100, if they're attached at 180 degree angles, sort of running flat, it's straight away you can rule out things like sycamore to get to something like a, a Norway maple as well. So if you're from North America or maybe even Scotland, then this is a tree that you might know as a sycamore as well. Or the plane tree, London plane, hybrid plane. It goes by a few different names. Um, in North America, what we call the plane tree, the Americans call the sycamore. 
then what we call the sycamore, what the Americans call the plane tree, uh, can, can be quite quite confusing. I recently had a chat, a conversation with someone on Twitter, an American tree surgeon, where we were both referring to the same tree under different names, and it took us a little while to actually work, work out we're talking about the same tree. Um, so again, this is a very, very distinctive tree, either because it's a very tall grand tree in a park, or it's a reduced or pollarded street tree. Uh, very versatile. Uh, I'm a big fan of the tree. A lot of people don't like them. Um, if you in sort of April and May time, it's very understandable why some people don't like them because of all the, the hairs off the leaves and the seeds are shedding. Um, if you get that in your throat, it's not nice at all. So this is something that I refer to as lazy identification because elements of the plane tree are so distinctive that you can be like half. Oh, you half glance, you walk past, you're like, yeah, plane tree, and walk off. And all of a sudden, you know it's a plane tree, but you don't know why it's a plane tree as such. Uh, because you may only know one feature. And kind of that can be, because it's a tree that can be so easy to identify as a plane, all of a sudden you're not seeing all those other elements, which are really important. So looking at the bud of the tree, so these are, again, alternates, sort of green. They, they can be ready purple. You can have on the same twig, you can have you know, red, green, purple. It can be quite tricky. And these are sort of sat in like a little cup and a very sort of greeny shoot that's a bit ribbed. Early in the year, they can be covered in like a downy hair as well. One of, the, one of the parent species of the hybrid plane is the oriental plane, which sort of grows along the river banks. And where you have trees that are more associated with areas of water, they also go through periods of drought, and then they tend to have these small hairs as a way of protecting against water loss. So sometimes you can have uh, sort of coatings of hair as well in these twigs. And again, there's an example of the uh, green and um, so green and purple on the same bud. And this I just included because I think it's quite cool. So this was the terminal bud and this was a lateral bud. And there's something in the way in which trees grow, which is called sympodial growth, S-Y-M-P-O-D-I-A-L, which means that when the tree wants to, it can terminate its leading bud for redirect growth from a lateral bud. Basically, it's a way of maximizing sun exposure. And where you to go back one more, where you have trees like, like plain, like oak, like rubinia that have really zigzag branches, that's an end result of that sympodial growth. <clears throat> a lot of times when you think about how trees grow, we tend to see it as like Christmas trees, which I think that's from, you know, wanting trees to grow upwards for forestry purposes, where we think they just have a central leader that grows upwards and upwards and upwards, whereas actually the tree can redirect its own growth at will. So, you know, that would have been the central leader at one point before it branches off. And now it's gone all zigzagged and crisscrossed because it's sort of wanting to maximise its own sun exposure. So it, it can terminate its terminal buds to redirect from wherever it wants to. Uh, again, something that I find utterly mind blowing. I quite like looking at the canopy of trees to try and work out where the trees redirect its growth. Um, and of course, these seed balls are another kind of lazy identification feature because these are almost unique to plain. There's a couple of other trees like the sweet gum, liquid amber, that have similar seed pods, but these are very distinctive to plain. But less known are the, the flowers or the inflorescences called akines. Uh, you have all these amazing crimson red filament strands bundled together in a sphere. For such like a big hulking tree. These are very tiny and delicate. So again, you really have to get in close and find some low down branches to see these uh, flowers. They're really, really stunning. So again, that's not strictly winter <laughs> identification, but over the growing season, these will convert into these. And these are much bigger and much more easy to see. And again, these seeds are very distinctive to plain. Uh, and of course, the bark, another lazy identification feature. Again, this is so characteristic of plain, you know, perhaps you might be able to confuse it with a eucalyptus. Um, 
other but other trees that do this like the strawberry trees the hybrid strawberry trees they're much much smaller than the plain trees for trunk um again go up and touch the tree if you feel this it's incredibly smooth and very very cold but again getting to grips with that touch is really crucial as well um what the reason why plain trees do this is um there's a uh, every year the tree goes through two growth phases a primary growth and secondary growth phase so i just had a family member come into the room there distracting me but um the primary growth is where it produces its new branches and new leaves and that's the tree growing upwards and outwards to grow to new new sun areas whereas the secondary growth kind of happens in sort of june july time and that's the trunk of the tree expanding outwards that's the new growth ring the new annual growth ring being produced and on softer smoother barked trees like the plane it because it's being pushed from the inside out that's when it starts to shed um shed its bark uh, in the modern environment it's a great way of shedding pollutants off the bark but you know it, this tree's been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years so it predates modern pollution where you have big plates coming off the tree that can be a sign of a good growth year whereas these sort of smaller plates it might be because it's uh either an older tree it's not had quite a good growth year as well and again the london plain can be confused with sycamore so looking at the the colors of the bark they're two typically quite smooth bark trees but the uh plane tree tends to it, well, it can range from green to brown to uh cream to olive to all sorts of colors whereas the sycamore tends to be like a gray a gray brown and then you know, they can sort of flake off in different ways as well and again if you're from north america then the, the plane tree and the sycamore uh, are flipped over as well now beech and hornbeam i've deliberately grouped these two together <clears throat> because they're superficially incredibly similar and again it's one that took, took me quite a while to get to grips with so ultimately beech trees will typically grow larger than hornbeam uh, they both have alternate buds. They're both sort of brown, both sort of fairly small, both quite narrow, and both scaled. But it's two terms, ad pressed and divergent, that are key. Um, anyone who's been on my walks before, you'll know that I do my utmost to avoid as much technical botanical terminology as possible. But in this case, the terms ad pressed and divergent are very important. So the hornbeam has ad pressed buds, and these are buds that are ad pressed against the stem. So if you look at the most recent year's buds, these are kind of pointing, that they're very tight to the stem, pointing toward in this example, they're, they're pearl, but typically they're pointed um, towards the end of the stem, pointing towards the end of the twig, and they're roughly parallel to each other. Whereas the beech, the buds are diverging divergent divergent away from the stem as well and again looking at the the, the internodal gap on beech they're typically much a much longer internodal gap whereas the hornbeam is a much much shorter internodal gap uh, and again you can have things like more pronounced lens cells slightly ribbed twigs on the hornbeam whereas the beech is a bit smoother but really the best and biggest way to tell the difference is look for the ad pressed buds on the hornbeam and the divergent buds on the beach that's for me the best out of leaf it's the best way um, then we look at the seeds they're very different unfortunately they don't hang around on the tree for too long but they can well, if you've got an unhealthy stressed disease beech tree it it does retain its seeds seed pods that can be a way of looking, identifying it as a beach. For me and my job, that's a useful way of assessing tree health. But um, these are typically land at the base of the tree. So you, you can have the base of the tree covered in these, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, just yeah, cases, small, slightly spiky cases. Whereas on the hornbeam, you have the nut attached to helicopter Samaras-like almost sycamore-esque 
um, structures that help it spread in the wind. Uh, parakeets seem to love these nuts. I've seen dozens and dozens of parakeets in the hornbeam stripping it bare of seeds. Whereas in the olden days, wild boars would love, uh, they used to go crazy for um, things like uh, the beach seeds or the beach mast, as it's called. And then looking at the trunk as well, in the, again, in their younger years, the two trees, the bark looks very, very similar. But this one, the hornbeam, it's a more greeny grey type of bark. But it goes into these what we call fluted patterns. Whereas the beech, it's a more silvery grey and it tends to be a bit smoother as well. Uh, this one's one of my all time favourite trees in Hatfield Forest. Just a bit of cultural history with the beech and the hornbeam. You might think that the term hornbeam is an unusual name for a tree. And that's because it comes from the Old English where horn meant iron and beam meant wood. So the hornbeam means the iron wood because it's a very strong, very tough wooded tree. So again, in the days before um, well, the Industrial Revolution, before metalworking and coal dominated, this the wood from this tree would be used for any type of timber that needed to be load bearing. And classically, it was used as uh, the middle cog of the cartwheel, uh, tool handles and stuff. And again, pre-industrial era in London, it was predominantly uh, areas like Epping Forest and the Great North Wood was made up of hornbeam, pollard and coppice, which is where a tree management method for getting a lot of sort of straight grown young wood for either timber or charcoal. So in the history of London pre-industrial revolution, the hornbeam for me is just one of the most important things in the history of London because it, that, that and the oak pretty much fueled London into the industrial revolution. Whereas the beach on the other hand, <clears throat> the word beach is a deviation of the word bock, B-O-C-H from old, old Germanic, which is also the root word of the term book. And because beach timber is a much softer, more malleable, easy to carve wood, before we had uh, mass produced paper, uh, beech wood tablets were quite often used for carving. And I mentioned about five characteristics of each tree. It doesn't have to be anatomical features. Think of ways and stories, something that helps you associate things and because the bark of the beech is so smooth think of the beech tree as the book tree and also especially on these older beech trees you'll see people who sort of carve their names and, and initials into the trunk of the beech tree as well so you can very much think of the beech as the book tree and the hornbeam as the iron tree uh, and this is <clears throat> i saw this tree for the first time in epic forest last year near uh, Buckhurst Hill in Knighton Wood and this trunk it kind of I've, I've literally seen millions of trees but as soon as I saw this it's sort of catapulted into my top 10 all-time trees um, absolutely love this tree and so I just wanted to include it as a personal favourite. Uh, moving on to the next tree oak I kind of couldn't do uh, a presentation on tree identification without the oak so again it's a much more distinctive tree and this is one that you can quite comfortably identify it just from the shape and the structure and the stature of the tree. And this one's quite important to show as well because there's a very distinct characteristic that while oak trees of many, many species, there's, there's literally hundreds of oak trees across the world. Some are very, very difficult to identify, but they all have a consistent budding pattern. When I say they all do, there's always going to be some random tree hidden away in the depths of a, a, a gorge or a gully in, in probably in China somewhere that does something a bit differently. But by and large, the trees we're going to see, they all follow the same pattern. And it's <clears throat> this, the bud cluster or the bud crown, which is where you have the terminal bud, which I mentioned at the start, flanked by two lateral buds. Same up here. And what that means is say this bud dies in uh, the frost or it gets pecked off by a bird or it gets eaten by an insect you have these insurance policies to sort of grow uh, to keep on growing or the tree might just want to terminate that and grow from here but this sort of bud cluster bud crown is really consistent across all oak trees and it's just you know, regardless of this oak species you see that budding pattern 
So again, you look at the tree, you don't know what it is. You can see it's an alternate budded tree, but it's got this distinct bud cluster. So you can use that to pretty much get down to oak. And if you're in an arboretum or a, an urban park and it's not a label tree, straight away you can use that to get to oak. And then you can perhaps look for other features such as the distinct type of buds in your, in your, your tree guide or your apps or your botanical key. Um, so again, some other features, very small leaf scar, some raised lens of cells, very small internodal gap, uh, and also note the colour, the shape and the texture of the twig as well. Um, so this is a red oak. Uh, it hasn't come out as clean as I'd hoped in the image, but these are a much, much more pointed bud cluster. And this is a turkey oak where the buds are smaller, but they're covered in these sort of <clears throat> wispy hairs. Um, Apologies to the image quality of that, but it's, you can find very good images in Google as well. And something else, your identification features, sometimes the associated ecology can help you find it as well. So these are oak balls. So these are created by micro wasps, which um, basically inject a hormone into either the leaf bud or the flower. And rather than creating leaves or acorns, uh, they produce these little structures, which is where their next generation grows. This is like an insect incubator. And these black holes are where the buds, uh, the new insect emerges from. Uh, how they discover this, I don't know. But medieval monks found out that if you ground these up in a pestle and water, added a few more ingredients, it created a permanent ink source. And this was in Western civilization. The first permanent ink was created from these oak balls. Before that, it was just cave paintings and inscribing in wooden tablets. So this, these tiny, almost insignificant little oak ghouls advanced Western human civilization forward centuries. So I mentioned about the horn, that the horn being being one of the most important things in the history of London. These oak ghouls are amongst the most important things in Western civilization. Um, so again, if you want to, if you're into ecology and wildlife, you can sort of learn about ghouls and then the type of ghoul on a particular tree is something you could use as one of your five identification features as well. Um, and then the bark on an oak. So this is the English oak. So it's very different. But so this is like a brown grey colour, with big kind of brown chunks. But yeah, compare it to something like a turkey oak, which is a, a, a greyer bigger, chunkier. Uh, never quite known what these red patterns are. But again, so again, uh, the bark of an oak is quite distinctive as well. Or if you have other similar, similar S trees, you can just use the other identification features as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the acorns, the seeds are characteristic of oak as well. Um, I've included these two as well because a lot of people get confused between the English oak, the native oak, Quercus roba, and the sessile oak. Basically, the two characteristics are the leaf of a Quercus roba, English oak, common oak, doesn't have much of a leaf stalk, but the acorns are on a long stalk. Whereas the, eight, the leaves on a sessile oak are on a stalk, but don't have an acorn stalk. Now, rather than trying to remember both of them, try and focus on one or the other. Try and focus on the leaves or the acorns. And then when you've got your head around that, you can move on to the next. Although this is winter tree identification, it's, it is easier to get to grips with the leaves. But if you just see the acorns, common oak has the long acorn stalk, whereas the sessile oak doesn't have an acorn stalk. Uh, birch, almost, almost at the end, don't worry. So again, this is another lazy identification tree. And it's also one that when people say, oh, I don't know any trees in winter, guaranteed you can get to birch because of how distinctive it is because of the shape, the structure and the bark. And this is a family characteristic of the birch family, but we're looking at catkins as well on this. So these are the buds. So we have a very, very, very thin oak twig and can't, again, can't, can't see it as hopefully I, I like, but 
These are very, very small black triangular buds which are pressed against the stem, sit in the cup. And again, you can see these uh, raised lenticels. And this is a really important one to touch and feel because <clears throat> this is a very rough, almost warty-like twig. And it's a, it's a great way of distinguishing between different types of birch trees is this is very rough, whereas others might be smooth. And of course, birch catkins. So these are the early season sort of birch flowers as such. And all trees in the birch family, so birch, alder, hazel, and hornbeam, produce these catkins. There are other tree groups that produce catkins willows, poplars, uh, walnuts, wingnuts, and the oaks, but they all produce very, very different types of catkins. Willows are very chunky and furry. Uh, walnuts basically look, look like green slugs, whereas the birch honey catkins are very long and delicate and thin, and quite often a yellowy colour. So again, you see a tree in winter. Right now, you'll be able to see uh, hazel in in flower with its catkins, and straight away you can sort of see that, and you can identify that down to a particular group of trees, and then you can sort of go from there with a few other features. And again, here's an example of the hazel catkins as well. Uh, ash, I think this is the last tree. In winter, an easy one to confuse with oak. It has quite a similar uh, structure, a very zigzagged, messy, clustered canopy. A slightly different branch habit, and the trunk itself is more gray and brown. But again, we're back to opposite buds here, and you can see these, so, so it's a small bud cluster, but the difference between this and oak is that you have opposite budded here. Very small internodal gap at right angles to each other. You can see the leaf scar, you can see the colour of the twig. Look at the texture or feel the texture how it, and the patterns. And, you know, you compare it to the ash against the sycamore, the maples and the chestnuts. Despite these being the three most common opposite by the trees, they're all distinctly different. And the ash group, the maple group, and the horse chestnut group, or buckeye, as they call it in America, despite being opposites, they're all very, very different. These are on these are on stalks, these are overlapping scales, these are I don't even know how you describe these. Uh, small black felty triangles, pyramids. And then, of course, the bark of the ash is another one that changes over time. It goes from like an olive green colour when it's young to a whitey grey colour uh, as it matures. And again, a slightly different pattern, uh, the oak compared to the ash. Um, I talked about associated ecology. There's a lot of lichens and algae that are associated with ash. Seeing these sort of yellow or green, sometimes even red speckles on the trunk can help you get to ash as well. Um, and then the seeds as well. So these are ash seeds, very similar to sycamore, but as we see here, whereas these are in pairs with one pair to a stalk, these hang individually and you tend to have um, multiple seeds to a cluster. And whereas these break off very easily in the wind, these can stay attached in bunches across the winter as well. Um, and then all ash trees produce seeds like this, very distinct. So some final comments. Don't be intimidated by the challenge, don't be put off. It's all that I can remember, it's just practice and repetition, perseverance and patience. Don't overload it and avoid lazy identification. Look at it in more depth. You can actually have a lot of fun doing that. And you know, start with five, only start with five trees, familiarise yourself with them, look for those five key principles that help you learn with each tree. I'd always say go with the buds, the bark, uh, the buds, yeah, the buds, the bark and the seeds, if you can see the seeds, and then look for something else. It could be a particular pattern or associated with something, like I said about the beech tree being the brick tree. It could be that you have a particular memory of the tree associated with something. Um, what works for you, do it your own way, the way that you learn. Uh, I, and my recommended trees, depending on where you are, horse chestnuts, the easiest to learn, in my opinion. 
Sycamore and then Ash, getting to grips with those opposite budded and then working from there. And then maybe something like moving to Oak or Lime. If you feel like you are familiar with them, then expand into other ones like the Sweet Chestnut, um, or just go or start with native trees, or you might fancy a challenge in wanting to get to grips with all the oak trees. I had to give that up because I found oak identification so confusing. I was just giving myself a migraine, really. Um, or, you know, birch trees can be quite a good one, or, you know, or just whatever's in your local park or your local woodland. Uh, and we'll finish there.